The plasma membrane is one of the most important structures found in all cells. It provides a selectively permeable membrane that keeps the inside of the cell from being in contact with the outside of the cell and makes life possible. In this video, we're gonna specifically discuss the nature of the plasma membrane, what it looks like, and how it does its job. So stay tuned. Hi, and thanks for tuning in. Today, we're talking about the plasma membrane. The plasma membrane is so important to life that it's found in all cells. In all living things, you're gonna find a plasma membrane to provide that selectively permeable barrier to keep things in and out of the cell and make what's going on inside of a cell different from what's going on outside. In a very real sense, without plasma membranes, life could never exist. Now, if you remember from our conversation, uh, about prokaryotic and eukaryotic cells, you know that there are some subtle differences between archaea plasma membranes and the plasma membranes found in bacteria and eukaryotes. In bacteria and eukaryotes, the plasma membrane is going to consist of phospholipids. They're going to have these, uh, this glycerol group that's attached to two fatty acid tails, which are hydrophobic, and then you'll have a phosphate group with its negative charge that makes it hydrophilic. These will stack to form a lipid bilayer, that will, perform the, that will form the selectively permeable barrier. Those hydrophobic tails act as a really good barrier to repel pretty much anything that tries to get through it. There are subtle differences in archaea. You can go back and check out my, my video on prokaryotic cells to learn those differences, but it doesn't matter. Uh, those differences don't really change the way the plasma membrane behaves to form that selectively permeable barrier. Now, that selectively permeable barrier is actually a double-edged sword, right? Because if you think about it, things can't really get across it. That means that bad things can't get into the cell and the good things are trapped inside. But it also means that good things the cell needs to survive are trapped outside of it and bad things like waste products are also trapped on the inside. So there needs to be a way where things can get across this selectively permeable barrier. That way of, uh, of moving things across the plasma membrane is known as transport, and we'll talk about that in a separate video. In this video, we're going to specifically discuss what the plasma membrane looks like and how it behaves. So let's take a look at the plasma membrane. About 40% of the plasma membrane structure actually consists of phospholipids, and the phospholipids do the heavy lifting of forming that that selectively permeable barrier. But there are other lipids also found inside the plasma membrane. Most notably in animal cells, you're going to find cholesterol. So if you remember, cholesterol is that lipid that has all those different ring structures in it that inserts itself in the membrane to promote membrane integrity. It keeps the membrane from freezing when it's too cold and it keeps it from falling apart when it gets a little bit too hot. So cholesterol is an important component or another lipid found in most plasma membranes, particularly in animals. But about 50% of the constituents of the plasma membrane are actually proteins. So there are four major types of proteins that we often find in plasma membranes that help the plasma membrane perform its functions, but also allow the cell to function sort of in spite of the plasma membrane. The first type of protein you're gonna find inside of the plasma membrane are what we call transporters. So transporters are proteins that allow transport to occur. They are going to allow the things that cannot freely cross that lipid bilayer to get across. And we'll talk about those again in a separate video in more detail. Another type of protein that you're going to find inside the plasma membrane are what are called receptors. So one of the things that the plasma membrane does is it prevents signals from making it into the cell. A cell needs to be able to recognize changes in its environment, adapt to changes in its environment, and alter its behavior in response to that. Receptor proteins are the way that that happens. They interpret external signals and relay those signals to the inside of the cell through a process known as signal transduction. Another type of protein that you're gonna find inside the plasma membrane are anchors. Particularly in eukaryotic cells, you are going to find tissues being formed between similar cells. Well, that is going to require cell-to-cell -cell junctions to occur. So things like desmosomes and gap junctions and things like that. Those cell junctions are formed by anchor proteins that help to anchor cells to each other. But they can also serve as anchors anchoring the cytoskeleton to the plasma membrane as well. The fourth type of protein that you'll find are enzymes. There are lots of chemical reactions that need to occur at the plasma membrane, and those are performed by enzymatic proteins that exist there. So enzymes exist for the fourth kind of protein. Now, there are two broad classes of proteins. We have what we call your integral membrane proteins. 
integral membrane proteins are proteins that traffic both sides. So they basically go all the way through the plasma membrane. Receptors, transporters, those have to be integral membrane proteins since their job is to bring things or bring signals from the outside of the cell to the inside of the cell. But enzymes and anchors can often be what we call peripheral membrane proteins. That means they're only embedded in the membrane. They don't stick out of both sides. Uh, typically, they tend to stick into the cytoplasm, but don't make it all the way through the lipid bilayer to the extracellular portion of the membrane. Now, one thing to remember is that the current model, the way we describe the plasma membrane is known as a fluid mosaic. So you do have all these different proteins that are embedded in the plasma membrane. Remember that they're not static there. They can be anchored through anchoring proteins. However, most often they are sort of like a, you can think of them as uh, proteins floating on a sea of phospholipids. They can move from point A to point B. And the other big thing to remember is because this phospholipid bilayer is sort of fluid in nature, plasma membranes can actually fuse with each other. This is gonna be very important when we talk about, for example, bulk transport. So uh, membranes can bud to form vesicles and those vesicles can fuse with other membranes because vesicles are really nothing more than uh, little pouches of membrane that are carrying cargo from point A to point B. Another thing, about 10% of what you find inside of the plasma membrane are actually carbohydrates. So carbohydrates, as well as some of the proteins, are very important for forming the extracellular matrix. Uh, one of the very important things that carbohydrates do inside of the plasma membrane or inside of the extracellular matrix is to promote cell-to-cell -cell recognition. Now, why is this important? Well, cells need to be able to communicate with each other. A great example of this occurs in your own body. So you have this wonderfully intense immune system whose job it is is to surveil your body and make sure nothing bad makes it inside of it, right? Well, your immune cells have to have a way of identifying cells as foreign or identifying cells as self. And the main way that your cells identify themselves as being self is through the use of carbohydrates. So many of your immune cells have proteinaceous receptors in their membranes that are able to recognize specific carbohydrates on the surface of your own cells and say, hey, this is one of my, my cells, this guy's cool, I'm not gonna eat him or destroy him in any way, I'm not gonna bother him because he's one of our cells. But they also have protein receptors on their surface that recognize foreign molecules. So for example, if you get a bacterium in your body, well, that bacteria is not gonna have the same carbohydrates as you do, they will not have the self carbohydrates, they'll have something else. And those receptors on an immune cell can recognize those foreign carbohydrates and say, hey, this thing isn't supposed to be here, let's mount an immune response to this. So membrane proteins are also in, uh, hugely important for your immune system. Another great example of proteins at use in your immune system are antibodies. So antibodies are specialized proteins that are produced by your B cells. And the job of antibodies is to bind specifically to something typically on the surface of a, uh, of a foreign cell, whether it's a bacterium or, or, uh, or a worm or something else that's got in your body, or they can also recognize non-living entities like viruses. And they do this by being very specifically shaped so that they specifically interact with something on the surface of, a, of, a, of, a, of an invader, basically, of a pathogen. They should not, however, recognize your own cells because they are self because of the things that they have on their surface. But this specific interaction of carbohydrates and proteins can also work against you. One great example of this comes from viruses. Let's use, the, let's use HIV as an example. HIV and all viruses have protein spikes on their surface. Now these protein spikes are uniquely shaped for each virus. But what's interesting is these protein spikes can be recognized by specific receptors found on the surface of some of your cells. So for example, in the case of HIV, there are two receptors on the surface of your T cells, which are another type of immune cell. One of them is called uh, CD4 and the other one is called CCR5. In order for HIV to actually infect one of your cells, CCR5 and CD4 have to recognize this protein spike on the surface of the virus. And in doing so, the virus tricks your cell into bringing that virus into the cell. Of course, once inside the cell, that virus is unpackaged and then begins to infect that cell and hijacks it as its new host cell. But here's something really cool. It turns out that there is actually a mutation in human beings called CCR5-Delta-32. And in patients that have CCR5-Delta-32, 
that CCR5 protein is shortened so that it doesn't stick out of the plasma membrane. It doesn't function as a functional receptor. And as a result, patients that have that particular mutation can't be infected by HIV. It turns out that for all viruses, there needs to be this recognition of its viral spikes, its protein spikes, by some type of receptor. And this is what actually leads to what we call viral tropisms. This is why viruses are so specific with respect to which host species they have and which cells they can actually infect. So in the case of HIV, the only reason why T cells can be infected specifically by HIV is because they're the only cells that have a CD4 receptor and a CCR5 receptor. If we look at your influenza virus, for example, influenza virus can only inf impact the respiratory cells because they're the only cells that have the right receptors to recognize the influenza virus. If we look at hepatitis viruses, for example, only liver cells have the correct receptors to recognize the viral spikes on the surface of hepatitis viruses. So while the protein recognition and specificity and interaction of proteins with carbohydrates is essential for normal immune cell function, it turns out that it can also work against us, often in the case of viruses. Thank you so much for tuning in today. I just wanted to do a brief video on plasma membrane structure. In our next video, we're going to talk about transport or how we get things across that selectively permeable barrier that is formed by the plasma membrane. Thank you so much for tuning in. I hope you learned a lot and I will talk to you guys real soon.